your dreams don't belong to you. If you hold on too tightly to them without recognizing the mutual and communal nature of creativity, your work will probably not have significant impact in the world. I think this is true across every creative medium, but the lens of my experience is music. Uh, the dream was music and is music, and my music does not belong to me. I failed Rock and Roll 101. The first rule of Rock and Roll 101 is you have to hate school. <laughs> I love school. Love school from kindergarten all the way to college. And if you ask the folks I went to high school with here in Memphis if they thought that I would end up being a musician, they would have said, absolutely not. He's going to be a lawyer, maybe a history professor, but certainly not an artist. The second rule of Rock and Roll 101 that I failed uh, was you're supposed to rebel against your parents. I didn't really do that either. Uh, you know, mildly here and there in middle school. But um, I got along great with my, with my parents and my entire family. Music was a, a big part of our household. Music filled the, the space in our house and on road trips. Um, as a matter of fact, when I graduated from the University of Tennessee, I came home uh, to Memphis and told my dad I wanted to have breakfast with him to talk about my, my future. And so we went to the coffee shop, the bagel shop there at, at Kirby and Poplar. And I told him I wanted to be a traveling singer songwriter. How do you feel about that? Which is not exactly a dream conversation for most parents. <laughs> and he asked me one question. He said, are you going to work hard at it? And I said, yes, sir, I am. And he said, all right, well, let's go to the guitar shop, get you a new guitar, send you on your way. And that night I asked my mom the same thing. I said, mom, what do you think about this? And she said, I I'm, I'm fine with it if you make me one promise. I said, what's that? She said, just promise me I can always understand the lyrics. <laughs> Simple but tough request for some artists. The thing that uh, I love about music um, was the communal nature of it, the, the dancing, singing, going to festivals. Uh, I saw that music tells us our stories better than we can even tell them to ourselves. It speaks to our suffering, it speaks to our joy, makes us want to dance, makes us want to weep, makes us want to take a road trip, make love, and it narrates all the most personal and important moments in our life. When I was 17, uh, I went through a personal tragedy. I was out of the country for the summer learning Spanish, and I got a phone call that my younger brother had passed away, surprisingly and suddenly in the night. Now, my brother Jay uh, suffered from spina bifida. I was in a wheelchair, but it still was a, a massive surprise. I was devastated. I was uh, overwhelmed with grief, and the thing that met me more than anything else in my grief was music. I found myself listening to Radiohead and U2 and Van Morrison and David Gray, sometimes alone, sometimes with friends. And in that, I saw this incredible paradox that life is tragic and life is beautiful and music held those things together in tension better than anything else in my life did. So out of the soil of that uh, suffering, that experience, uh, I started to dream about making music. I wanted to make music that made people feel the way I felt in my darkest hour and maybe gave them a glimmer of hope in theirs. So with the support of my family and my community, I started making music. And I learned that my music didn't belong to me. First, uh, our dreams belong to those that came before us. The thing, I, one of the many things I love about music is how you, you find this artist that you like. Let's say for me, it was Ryan Adams. And it's like going into a Ryan Adams room and you listen to all his records, and then you want to find out where he came from, and so you end up in the Bob Dylan room, and then, and then you end up in the Woody Guthrie room, and you're like, well, who else did Woody Guthrie inspire? And you're like, oh, I'm over in the Springsteen room, and then you find out you're over here in the Otis Redding room, and then you're in the Aretha Franklin room, then you're in the Carol King room, and the next thing you know, you've spent a whole lot of money, and you've loved lots and lots of music, and you've been inspired by all this different stuff. It's beautiful. It's a family tree, and I love that about music. All of our creativity, no matter what we do, is rooted in the work of our predecessors. The second thing I learned that our dreams belong to our fellow dreamers. No matter what you do in your creative life, you have peers. For me, that's fellow songwriters, musicians, producers. And there's uh, friction there, there's competition, there's challenge, there's encouragement. It's a tough task to learn how to harness the jealousy and the comparison. But a lot of the artistic growth happens in that life on life that happens between you and your peers. Uh, I remember six or seven years ago, I was, I was two weeks away from starting a record that we came, to Na came back from Nashville here to Memphis to record it down the street at Ardent Studios, which is an amazing place. And uh, 
I wanted to play some of the songs for a good friend of mine. His name's Thad Cockrell. He's an artist that I respect a lot. And so I wanted to play the songs for him, get his, get his feedback. So I, play, I played three or four songs, and my wife Ellie, who's, who's in my band, my band at the time, was there with me. And I start playing this song, and I, I sing it like this. Sometimes I wake up with the sadness of the days. It feels like madness. So what would I do without... Stop, 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 he says. Like, you don't interrupt me. It's like, you know, I, it's not, I don't want that much of your input. So he says, no, 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 no. <coughs> so he says, no, 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 no. And he gets literally right in my face, two inches from my face, and he goes, Drew. Sing it to me like I'm right here. <laughs> Sometimes I wake up with the sadness of the day. Feels like madness. So oh, what would I do without you? And just like that, I had this entirely new palette to paint with that I didn't know was in me. And it's that friction, artist on artist, spurs our creative growth. Our role as musicians, as artists, is to, to, to make sense of the world through adding shape and color and noise to the world. And it's, it's, if you look at music history, this happens in the context of community. If you look at some great examples, um, Barry Gordy in Detroit, Motown Records. He gathers these songwriters like Smokey Robinson, Holland Holland and Dozier, and these incredible young artists like The Supremes, The Temptations, Jackson 5, Marvin Gaye. And in this moment in, in history, in this particular zip code, Magic happens and changes the course of music forever. Same thing happens in Laurel Canyon in the 70s around the Troubadour on Santa Monica Boulevard. Joni Mitchell, the Eagles, Jackson Brown, James Taylor, Elton John, all these incredible artists that literally their music defined a generation. It happened in this one particular place in community. I don't have to tell you that that's true here in Memphis as well. You have this uh, ambitious young producer, starts Sun Records, Sam Phillips, and he finds artists like Johnny Cash, Jerry Lee Lewis and Elvis, and literally changed history in this community of creative friction, tension, and encouragement, the shared dream. The third group that our dreams belong to, not without sounding cheesy, because it rhymes, I'm not trying to rhyme, uh, our dreams belong to the whole team. If you look on stage with me, you're going to see five people. You've got the, all, the, all the band members. And if you, if you get to know everybody, you're going to find five different first albums five different stories, five different first concerts, five different loves. Everybody's got their own thing that they bring to the table of making this thing happen. It's not just on stage. If you go to the soundboard and you talk to my sound guy, Thomas, you want to know his story. He's a liner note guy. He's listening to all these different records. Why does the drum on this record sound like this? And why does it sound different on this record? And he's learning microphones and compression and all these things that make music sound like it does, but also learning architecture of rooms and why does the bass sound so loud in this room and it's so soft in this other room and how can I fill it up to make it sound the way we need it to sound every night? Same thing happens with the lighting director, happens with your managers, your booking agents who went to see shows, realized they didn't have any talent and decided they could learn the business side of it and make it happen. <laughs> all of these things are puzzles that make the whole thing work. Lastly, your dreams belong to the Anybody in the world who lets your creative work into their life. I wrote a song years ago in, a, in sort of a, a, a bad moment for me. My career wasn't doing very well. I wasn't making any money. My van had just died. We, had no, we were borrowing cars to go from place to place. And uh, we were, had picked a date to hang it up. Not out of bitterness, just like, hey, it's not working. We need to hang it up. So we had a, a one year left of obligations to fulfill. My sister called me and told me she was moving from Nashville to uh, Panama, and I was overwhelmed with sadness because my three nieces and nephew were like the one shining light of hope in my life because um, I was so overwhelmed with kind of depression about the career not going well, but they didn't care about my career. They just loved me. So I wrote this song one night for them. I wrote it not for radio. I didn't write it for TV and film. I didn't write it to be cool. I wrote it as a gift to my nieces and nephews. Release the song, it becomes the song that sort of defined our career, a song called Live Forever. It gets picked up and put on all these different TV shows, Parenthood, Deadliest Catch, House, a few others. Next thing you know, our numbers in different towns are doubling, and it was all because of this song, the song that we gave away. A year later, I get an email from a girl. She says, I have no idea how I know your music. I don't know you at all, but somehow your music ended up on my phone, and my phone died, and I had a playlist of only 14 songs, and yours was on there. One night I decided life was too hard. I was going to give it up. I was going to kill myself. And all I had was this playlist. 
And the songs honestly were taking me deeper and darker into this moment. And then your song came on and made me feel like maybe I didn't want to give up yet. Maybe I wanted to give it another try, another day. I just wanted to tell you thank you. In that moment, I realized my dream came true, made someone feel the way I felt in my darkest hour, but it wasn't just me. It was the whole team. It was the music that I'd fallen in love with over time. It was the producer and the engineer who made the song, the band that made the song. Together, we made this dream come true. If you share your dreams, they just might come true.